Hi, let me show you something. Uh, here on my phone, I've got a tone generator, and it can create sound waves um, at various frequencies. Um, so, you know, I'll hit play here, and that's 1,000 hertz. It takes me right back to middle school. That's what our, our passing period bell sounded like, exactly. Uh, I can change the frequency, right? That's a higher frequency. A lower frequency. Let's go back to 1,000 hertz. Ah, oh, lovely. That's 1,045 hertz. And uh, just observe steady tone, right? I don't hear any variation in pitch. It's not getting higher or lower. There it was. All right, now we're at 990 hertz. It's not changing, right? Observe. Still steady, but not when I was moving it. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. The Doppler effect is the name for this phenomenon where the observed frequency uh, of a wave, um, in this case sound, but it could work for other waves too, where the observed frequency changes depending on relative motion of the source and the observer. In this case, the observer is the microphone in my computer and ultimately you on the other end. The source was my cell phone. When I was swinging the bag, we had relative motion between the microphone and the cell phone, and so we heard a variation in pitch. This is the Doppler effect. Let me show you another example. Okay, not the greatest video in the whole world, but I think it gets the point across. Hopefully we all heard that. The, the pitch of the fire engine, it, it stayed constant as the, as the fire engine was approaching us, and then as the fire engine passed, the pitch dropped. It went from higher to lower as the fire engine passed. And, and if you didn't observe that, back up and check that video out again. You'll see it's a pretty marked effect. That's another example of the Doppler effect. And so we've observed this in our life. Heck, even my five-year-old knows about the Doppler effect because my five-year-old knows that a race car goes and not that doesn't sound like a race car. That's what a race car sounds like. The pitch drops as it passes by us. So again, the Doppler effect is just this phenomenon where the observed frequency of a wave changes depending on relative motion of the observer and the source. Okay, so here it is in PowerPoint on a slide so it's official. The Doppler effect occurs when an observer of a wave is moving relative to the source of a wave. When this happens, the observer will observe a different frequency than the frequency emitted by the source. And we can get this phenomenon when the source is moving, which is what we've just uh, demonstrated, or when the observer is moving. And I guess I could put my computer in a bag and wing it around, but I'm going to go ahead and not do that. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you take my word for it. Had I held my cell phone steady and winged the computer around in the bag instead, we would have observed something very similar. I said it can happen with any type of wave, and water waves are sometimes some of the easiest waves to wrap our brains around because we can just look at them, and we've seen them for our whole lives. So here we see a uh, three uh, water skippers who are joyfully playing on the pond one day. And uh, this water skipper right here, he is moving to the right. And as he moves to the right, he's making little splashes in the pond. And so uh, we're going to color code these splashes. Now, the rings, here's the key feature of the Doppler effect, is that these the ripples from the splash as, this water, as the water skipper is making the splash, right? So in this case, the water skipper is the source of our waves. Those rings, they emanate out in circles, as we know, if you've ever dropped a pebble into a pond, you know that those ripples emanate out in a circle. But they emanate out in a circle from where the wave was created, not where the water skipper is now, right? So this green wave here, it's going to form circular rings out centered at this point. And a little while later, the water skipper makes another splash. But this ring is going to emanate out where? From where? From where the water skipper is now, not where he was. And now there's a red wave, and that's going to, again, 
make a circular ring centered at where the water skipper was when he made that splash. So these ripples continue out. And now we see that the waves are sort of bunched up in front, aren't they? They are bunched up in front and spread out in the back. So we can just see from this picture that the water skipper in front will observe a lower wavelength. Now remember, V equals lambda F. And the velocity of a wave is determined by what kind of a wave and what the medium is, right? So this is a water wave in a pond. That determines the, the velocity. So that means that as the wavelength goes down, the frequency must go up. And so the bug in front observes a smaller wavelength and a higher frequency. This is analogous to the fire engine as it's approaching. We hear a higher frequency and therefore a shorter wavelength. However, the bug that's in back, this bug observes a larger wavelength. Again, you can just look at the picture and see that as those ripples approach that bug, they're more spread out than they would be if the source of the wave was not moving. And so we see a larger wavelength. That means a smaller frequency. That's analogous to standing behind the fire engine. As it's moving away from us, we hear a lower pinch. And so this simulation is to help us visualize a moving source with a stationary observer. The same thing happens if we have a stationary source and moving observers. So here's this water skipper, skipper joyfully uh, patting his legs on the pond, and he's making these ripples. Now, he's not moving, and so the ripples emanate out concentrically, right? And so they're all, the source of all of those ripples is in the same place, and so we just see a bunch of concentric rings. Now, if this bug is moving away, we can imagine that these ripples will hit this bug um, a little bit more slowly, right? Whereas if this bug is moving towards the source, he will hit them a little bit more often. And so this bug will observe a higher frequency. Since it's observing a higher frequency, it would be like the wavelength was smaller, right? Now it's a little bit harder to see the wavelength being smaller here. So I think here it's easier to directly look at the, at the picture and see, oh, well, he's gonna hit those ripples faster. So the frequency goes up. Whereas for this bug that's moving away from the source, this bug is going to observe a lower frequency and therefore a longer wavelength. So whether we have the source moving relative to the observer or the observer moving relative to the source, we get the Doppler effect. Now, of course, it happens if both of them are moving. That's just a more complicated case. We could deal with that here, but we just choose not to. So here's these equations. Um, if you look online, there's different ways to organize these. Um, in fact, some, some textbooks uh, lump them all together. Um, but this is, I like the way our textbook does it. It, it, it uh, writes them as four separate equations. So we have one equation for the source approaching the observer. We have one equation for the source receding from the observer. And we have one equation for the observer approaching the source. And one for the observer receding from the source. Um, in your textbook, be careful. They use this notation of F naught. And so that is, they, they're referring to the F source. Um, I've chosen to change my notation here uh, because oftentimes students mix up the F naught, which is really F zero with F O and think that's the frequency of the observer, which it just isn't. The frequency of the observer is here, F plus, F minus, F plus, F minus. So these are the frequencies that will be observed and these equations tell us how to calculate that. Notice that the veloc two velocities show up here, right? Uh, the velocity of the source shows up here, and also the velocity of the wave. And so that V wave, that's the wave speed. So for a sound wave, which is you know mostly what we think of when we're thinking of the Doppler effect, for a sound wave, that's 343 meters per second. It turns out that these equations don't really work for electromagnetic radiation because ooh, electromagnetic radiation is just different. It's super weird. Um, and if we have a chance to talk about relativity towards the end of the semester, we'll get a chance to talk about why that is. Um, but the Doppler effect does exist for light waves. It's just we can't use these equations for that. Another caveat to mention in this is that these apply when the velocity of the source is smaller than the wave speed. And, and we can see why in this simulation that I had here, um, notice that the waves are still outrunning the source, right? In other words, 
the source is not out here in front of those ripples. That can happen. But when that happens, we get a different phenomenon, and it's called a shock wave. So a shock wave occurs when the velocity of the source exceeds the wave speed in a given medium. And so I grew up in Wyoming, and when I was younger, uh, the, the, and when I was younger, the Air Force used to fly jets and practice uh, their supersonic flight over Wyoming, I guess because they assumed nobody lived there. Um, and so we would hear sonic booms quite often uh, caused by jets from Hill Air Force Base, uh, which is in Utah. And so, uh, and I don't know if you've ever heard one, it's quite, a, it's quite a striking phenomenon. You're just hanging out and all of a sudden, boom, it's this loud boom and it rattles the house. It actually broke a window in our house one time. Um, so it's just this loud boom, and, and, it ca and it's caused from sound waves stacking up on each other. And we can see how that happens in this series of pictures. So here we've got some source, and maybe it's a supersonic jet flying much faster than the speed of sound. And here, here's where this jet is at various times. Now, the jet's creating noise, right, very noisy, and so it's creating these sound waves. These sound waves are emanating from some location. Well, they're emanating out in circles, much like with the bug, but they're emanating out from the place where they were created, not the place where the jet is now. So we see these circles re representing the sound waves emanating out from the point where they were created. And notice we see this edge right here, this V-shaped edge, which is the leading edge of these sound waves. And the sound waves stack up there. We're going to talk a little bit more about how waves combine in the next chapter. But these waves are adding. And so, the, you know, the, notice that the sound wave created, say, at this point marked 5, at 5 seconds, and the sound wave from uh, 1 second, at this point right here, they're actually adding up, right? And so they're combining with each other in order to create this big old wave front, which has a very large amplitude. What's interesting is that the jet's flying by, and you might even see it, but you can't hear a thing, right? If I'm standing over here on the ground, then I can see the jet, but I can't hear it yet because the sound wave hasn't had a chance to get to me. And then all of a sudden, you'll hear the boom. Boom! And then you'll hear the jet. So it's like, boom! But you couldn't hear it at all. Completely dead silent before that sonic boom. It's quite an interesting phenomenon. So I've been talking about this in the context of supersonic flight, and that's a sound wave. That's a shock wave of a sound wave. But it can happen with other waves, too. Um, probably the one you've seen the most is the wake from a boat. So a boat creates a shock wave when it's moving faster than the wave speed of the waves on the surface of the water. And you can see that right here. That's this V shape right here. And we can see that we see a large amplitude right along this line right here. And that is the shock wave from this boat. You know, if you're uh, on some large lake or something like that, you may see a sign that says, uh, and you're on a boat, you may see a sign that says, slow, no wake zone. And I remember reading that when I was a kid and thinking, gosh, what do you mean no wake? Is it, the slower you go, uh, doesn't the wake just get smaller? I mean, how can, you, how can you drive your boat with no wake at all? And the answer is, you drive your boat at a speed that is below the wave speed of ripples on the surface of that water. And then you don't create a shock wave, you don't create a wake. So it is possible to drive your boat with zero wake. In this other picture, the one on the left here, we see a supersonic car. This is a car driving faster than the speed of sound. And well, we can't see sound waves. Remember what sound waves are. Sound waves are pockets of high pressure and low pressure. Higher than ambient pressure, lower than ambient pressure. That's what a sound wave is. And so while we can't literally see a sound wave, we can see pockets of high and low pressure because light bends slightly when it goes through those pockets of high and low pressure. Kind of like if you've ever uh, looked across the parking lot on a hot day and it looks all shimmery, all kind of wavy, and we think about it as the heat rising off. Well, we can't literally see the heat. What we can see is pockets of higher density air that's a little bit cooler and pockets of lower density air that's a little bit higher as light moves through those pockets of higher and lower density, it bends a little bit, and that's what makes it look all shimmery. So while we can't see the heat, we can see the effect of the heat. Similar here, we can't see a sound wave, but we can see the effect of it. And that's what these lines here are. And so we can imagine that what, what's happening in the air here is very similar to what's happening in the water right here. So this is a pretty cool, pretty cool.
pretty cool picture. I have one other video to show you. Here's, some, here's a video of some supersonic jets uh, flying past a crowd. Uh, the audio isn't great, but you'll get the idea. Um, do notice you can't hear the jet at all until you hear the sonic boom, and then it's quite loud. Another thing to notice is that those pictures I had are, are of course, in two dimensions. And so, you're, you're, I just drew a V-shape, right? But in three dimensions, that's a cone shape. And you can see that because of the condensation in the air. So check it out. All right. So what's happening in that cone that we were able to see is, remember, a sound wave is pockets of high pressure and low pressure. And in that shock wave, we see really huge amplitudes of, of a sound wave. And so we see great differences between high and low pressure. And so it just happens that the dew point decreases with pressure. And so the dew point of, is, of course, the point where uh, dew or water droplets will spontaneously form out of the air. Right? That's why uh, when you wake up in the morning, the grass is wet out in, out in your yard. The dew point also varies with temperature. When the temperature goes down, the air can hold less moisture, and so it, the, the, the moisture is forced out of the air and forms the droplets on the ground. Well, the same thing happens with varying pressure. When the pressure goes down, the air can hold less moisture, and so water droplets form. And really, a cloud is is microscopic water droplets. When you see a white cloud, it's actually not just water vapor. It's actually microscopic water droplets. And so what you're seeing there in that, that V-shaped cone around the airplane is a pocket of very, very low pressure. And in that very low pressure, the low pressure air can hold less moisture. And so the water is spontaneously, uh, is spontaneously condensing into tiny water droplets and forming a cloud. And when you see the jet going by and the, the little cone is flashing on and off and on and off, it's because the pressure, you know, the, the dew point varies with temperature and pressure. And so that pocket of air is going above the dew point, below, above, above, below. And, and we're seeing that, that condensation form and disappear and form. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Let's do a Doppler example. <clears throat> An opera singer in a convertible sings a note at 600 hertz while cruising down the highway at 25 meters per second, as opera singers will do. What is the frequency heard by a person standing beside the road in front of the car? Well, let's just uh, make a quick sketch. Here's my opera singer. La! Okay, and here's my listener. And don't worry, this person is going to duck out of the way just in time, okay? They're not going to get run over. Don't worry. Um, and so we've got this opera singer cruising down the road at V equals 25 meters per second and we want to know what frequency this person is going to hear. So we have F source equals 600 hertz. Um, will this person hear a frequency that is higher than 600 hertz or lower than 600 hertz? Hopefully you picked higher because we have relative motion that's coming together, right? The source is moving towards the observer. So we'll hear a higher frequency. Now what we want to do is we want to look at these equations that I gave you. So let's get those in front of us. And now we go through here and we just find the equation that matches our situation. In this case, it's the first one. We have the source approaching the observer. So let's go ahead and write that down. There's our equation. And once we've picked out the equation and visualized the situation correctly, uh, these problems typically are just plug and chug. So let's see what we get. The V of F of the source, well, that was 600 hertz, divided by 1 minus V source, 25 meters per second, divided by V wave. Well, what kind of a wave is this? A sound wave in air. And I've told you that unless I tell you otherwise, go ahead and use 343 meters per second for the speed of sound. And now we run our calculator. And we got 647 hertz. Does that jive with what we were thinking? Uh, yeah, it should be a little bit of a higher frequency. Makes sense. Oh, here's one for you to try. An opera singer in a convertible sings a note at 600 hertz. Okay, it's the same situation. What if this person was standing behind the opera singer instead? Why don't you go ahead and uh, 
pause the video and give it a shot. I'll do the solution next. Well, the only difference here is now my person standing behind the opera singer instead of in front. We pick out our different equation. The only difference between the equations is this becomes plus instead of minus. And same numbers we calculated out. We get 559 